Well, good morning, everyone. So let me set you up, okay? Once the anointing, once I touch your forehead and anoint you, you receive from God. So you have God on the inside of you, God all around you. But you have to give him the invitation for him to do something new. So when I anoint you, you believe for God to move you to the next level. Doesn't matter where you are. He knows exactly how to minister to you. But what's going to happen to you, you're going to find out. Now listen to me carefully. You're going to find out all of a sudden miracles start happening more. Because his anointing is functioning in you more. See, it's the God in us that does the miracles. Can you say amen? It's the anointing. The anointing and God are one. But the anointing we can take and we can release. Like a part of God we can fling and we can release and we can pray over people. But God lives in us. So when I anoint you, when I come around and anoint you, you receive everything God wants and purposes for you. Now, we have a tendency to want to get it at that moment. But many times it's as we go and believe and talk with God, the anointing will grow. And this will grow through all of your life. This is not just a one-time anointing. We're going to do it in two weeks, you know. This is something that's going to grow in you and develop in you because God lives in you. So as you do that and as you nurture your walk in your closeness with God, he's going to encourage you to become bold and confident. And that boldness and that confidence, somebody or someone might need something and might need you to put that anointing on them. You follow what I'm saying? And like God has been telling us and We've been teaching for four and a half years, preparing you for the Zen times and getting you ready here in the last couple of weeks for the anointing of God for you to receive. Are you ready to get in the word? going to call this growing and flowing in the spirit growing and flowing in the spirit God wants us to develop but we only develop under God's care now I don't know about you but when I went to Bible college there was this idea that I had that the more knowledge I got the more I'm going to be blessed of God now there's a truth to that because the more knowledge we know about God the more we can believe God for those things can you say amen when we find out that God loves us and cares for us, he's not our worst enemy, and we find out what things are what things, then we can relax and open up to God. We found out every good and every perfect gift comes from who? There you go. And you know, we cannot, I'm going to give you this one, don't take life's experiences over the word. Okay. Life, for example, say you're believing for healing. But healing has not quite manifested in your flesh. See how I said that? Mm -hmm. Don't take that experience as God not healing you. Find out maybe what's blocking. Find out maybe what's hindering. But don't get under guilt or condemnation. Because God's all about you. Can you say amen? He's all about his family. He's all about rescuing us. Taking good care of each individual. So keep that thought in mind as we study today. A growing and flowing with God. Amen. Now we want to turn around and we want to read our scriptures. They're in Hebrews chapter 2. Okay. 
I like that, Danny. Look at the backdrop there. Isn't that cool? Yes. All right, so Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and then we got another one after this. So how shall we escape? This is talking about the rapture now. If we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken to us by the Lord, that's Jesus, and was confirmed to us by those that heard him. God also bearing witness. Now, I want you to see this. God will always bear witness to his word. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. You see, that's the anointing. And we go to the next scripture. Verse 12 through 14. For though I live, this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the utterance or oracles of God. Now, let me set you up on this. Here Paul is talking to the Hebrew Christians that have abandoned Jesus Christ. They have gone away from the Lord. They're scared. They're trying to protect their life. They're trying to hide from people getting killed and murdered. You know, and so they're, they're abandoning anything that has to do with God. And that's an overdoing. People shouldn't abandon God. They should run to him. Say amen, somebody. And it says, you have come to need milk again, to be taught again, and not solid food. Now, this is not a rebuke to you. This is a rebuke to those that bail out on God. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a baby. But solid food belongs to those of a full age. Say, that's me. Because you have God in you. That is, those by reason of use or practice have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. God is good and perfect, isn't he? And when they ate the tree, the tree was the knowledge of good and evil. So you and I are exposed to good and evil every day. We, we see and hear good and evil every day. Now, because we walk with the Lord, the anointing of God is to help us strain out the evil, the negative in our life and to embrace the positive and to bring forth a good message to our friends and our loved ones. Is there somebody you've been talking to about the Lord? Sharon, that's where that anointing comes in. Laying hands on the sick, don't be ashamed of doing that. Well, what if they don't get healed? Stop thinking that way before you pray for them. Why do we always think the bridge is out before we get there? Because of the negative training. No, we need to be exercised in the things of God. And that's what we're doing. We're getting you ready and get you ready to receive from the anointing, okay? Let me read my paragraph to you. Blessings to you, church family. We've been talking about reigning in life in Christ Jesus, haven't we? As we have become new creations, new species of being, we are to walk in God with his powerful anointing. We're not to be religious or we're just Christians. No, we have an assignment to go share the good news of the gospel. We are a city set on a hill, a light of the world. Amen? And light are meant to enlighten the way. We're to share the truth and the insight to the word of God. And those of you that know how to pray, you're bringing God in prayer to people. Can you say amen? I love to pray because God showed me a long time ago, we bring God to people and we bring people to God. That's the ministry of an intercessor. That's the ministry of somebody under the anointing. They can take somebody that doesn't know how to pray or maybe how to ask for the right things. And you can say, Lord, I lift up Dave, and I put Dave into your hands. Lord, I pray that today you go into his life, and you go into whoever Dave is, okay? You know, you can think of And go into his life and begin to reason with him, begin to talk with him, get him ready to open his heart. Let him become sorry for being away from you. Let him open his heart and see and feel the love. See, and as you pray that, you're bringing what? You're bringing light you're bringing God, and you're bringing God's angels in to minister. Can you say amen? How many here know that every human being, in case you don't know, is a possible heir of salvation? So if you're human, salvation is a possibility for us. 
Now, you and I already accepted Jesus. We already have Jesus in our heart. Can you say amen? So our job is to go and get others to do the same. God wants how many people saved? Everybody saved. He wishes that all would come to the knowledge of the truth, and that none would perish. Amen. So as I read along to you a, a little bit more, this is how Jesus really wants us to walk, under the anointing, under submission to the Heavenly Father, and that with him and us working together, we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. But we have a wonderful package, an infectious gospel that you and I can go share with people. And folks, here's a neat thing. You know, human beings are designed to hear about God. They have something in their heart called their spirit. You guys have a spirit. And it, it listens for God. It wants to have something that satisfies us. Now, when I was in the world, I tried to get this ache in my heart filled with everything else but God. Maybe you did the same thing. And only because there was an ache in my heart, I needed it to be fulfilled. And when I found Jesus, that was it. Can you say amen? Beer didn't work, all of the things of the world, the, the drugs, the playing rock and roll music and having people say, oh, you're such a good drummer and all this self-praise and all, doesn't make it. Can you say amen? It really has to do with our walk and our love with Jesus. And to love him so much, we just want to give him away. And when you give Jesus away, you get more. Hello? How can you do that? Sowing and reaping. So if I give more Jesus to you in this sermon, God is going to give me more Jesus and more revelations of Jesus. So do you think I'm a foolish man standing up here wanting to give you the word? No, because I'm going to get more. And you are too. That's why God wants you to share your faith. Just share the things that God is doing in your heart. He loves that. Why? It's good news to a lost and dying world. All right. Let me give you a little thing to kind of put a little pin on. We are to walk with Christ flowing with him, moving in the spirit under the anointing. And today we're going to anoint you so that you can. You ready? Yeah. Amen. We're going to cover these four areas. Number one, we're equipped to give out Jesus' anointing. We have been equipped to give out Jesus' anointing. Two, we have an anointing to know and to flow. It's already in you. We're going to cover three. The will of God is, is you and I staying filled with the Spirit. Can we do that, Pastor? Ken? Yes, you can stay filled with the Spirit. You see, if my glass is full, there's no room for junk to be put in it. Hello? If I'm filled with the Spirit all the time to where it's overflowing, even because the Spirit's overflowing, the enemy can't put anything into my life because the Spirit is overflowing and knocking it out. Amen. So we are to be Spirit-filled constantly, and that's why pastors have been teaching for years, meet with God first. Well, I'm tired of hearing that, Pastor Gary. Guess what? Go ahead and quit and see what happens. I found out it's kind of like, um, how many of you ever see when those squirrels and, and one of those little, you know, they run on that thing, you know, and they run real fast. And, you know, and it's a circle like thing, like a merry-go-round, but standing vertical. And they're running there. And then the only time they go anywhere is when they stop and they're flung out of there. Well, that's the world. The world wants you to get into their merry-go-round, get into their, their thing, and boogity boogity be and let the circumstances make you want to rush, hurry up. Listen, God is not in a hurry. He's absolutely on time, in flow, and that's why God wants us to learn to flow with him. You'll feel there's something out there will say, no, you're late, you're going to be late, going to be late, and then in your spirit say, no, you're at peace and rest. Know the difference between out input and inside input because inside is where God lives and where God guides us. Can you say amen? We're living from the inside out and not from the outside in. All right. And then fourthly, we learn to move in the spirit confidently. We're supposed to move in the spirit confidently. Not look like some flake. Ooh, you know? God guides me constantly and has me call people and say things. Sometimes I'll say just two words to somebody, but because they're his words, 
things happen. So aren't you know that you're a wonderful delivery person that you bring the almighty God to the lost, to the dying. There are a lot of Christians that don't know what you know. When, you, when you're around visiting with people, listen to them and then give them a word of encouragement. Don't you ever be with somebody that you don't leave them a little Jesus when you go away. Come on, say amen. All right, let's look at our first point. Equipped to give out Jesus' anointing. Now go with me to a very familiar scripture, Acts chapter 3. We're looking at Peter and, and John. They are at the gate, beautiful, about the ninth hour of prayer. Now into the temple, there was a gate out in the front of it. And there was a fountain in the pool. And people would hang out there. they just talk and hang out there. You know, the Jewish people would gather. Jesus was often there. So after Jesus died and rose again, because God lives in Peter and John, and they were told by God to go into all the world and preach the gospel, they realized. So here's this man. He's being brought to the gate beautiful every day since he was young to ask alms, to ask like the man on the side of the road saying, you know, I'll work for gas or whatever, I'll work for money. It's the same thing. He was there daily because he made good money. Now, there's some real keys that we need to look at. So you ready? You got Acts chapter 3? All right, so let's look at it. And now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms or an offering from those who entered the temple, who seeing... This, this, this man, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. Now look at what happened. Very important, because there's some principles here I want you to pick up on. Okay? And, and being, and seeing Peter and John, he fixed his eyes on him. And fixing his eyes on him, Peter and John said what? Look at us. You see, if you're going to minister to somebody, you've got to get their eyes. Eyes are the light of the body. Look on us. In other words, don't be distracted right now. We're going to get you healed, buddy. Don't be distracted right now. We're going to give you something that God wants you to have. Okay. And he goes on. Look on us. So he gave them his attention. See, that's the key expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, silver and gold we do not have. But what I do have, I give you. What does he have? Jesus. Now, folks, let me tell you this. You have Jesus in your spirit, man. There's not any Jesus in your head strong enough to do anything. So you want to fix your mind on Jesus, but God lives in our spirit man. Everyone say spirit man. Your spirit man is like a big wine bag, big sack. And it expands and it contracts. You get filled with the spirit and you pour the spirit out. It's like your lungs. You get filled with the spirit. You pour the spirit out. You get filled with the Spirit. Now, if you never pray, you never get with God on a daily basis, your spirit won't be able to expand or contract. You'll just hold there, and that's what's called the hardening of the heart. When we do not pray and do not seek God, don't ask God to cleanse us and wash us, we don't stay pliable, anointed, so there's no expanding and no moving in the Spirit. You get it? So guess what? Meet with God. He's the one that causes your spirit to be elasticized. So it can stretch and, and unstretch. And we're going to get to that. We're going to show you those things. But, oh, I know, Pastor Kerry. I know I should be doing this. I know I should be. I'm just hamming it, okay? But listen, Christians are notorious of knowing that they should be doing something. And not doing it. My, I'm not here to make you feel guilty. I'm just trying to tell you, without doing the word, you're not going to experience what the word says. So let me encourage you to be a doer of the word. And sometimes we just, we just don't feel in the mood to do it. Well, listen. Your condition of your walk 
is because of what you either open up to or what you close off to. So if you're not happy about where you're at yet, just keep opening up. God's on the way to, to give you that guided tour. Remember, he's conditioning us and getting us ready. So let's look at this. We're going to have fun. And then we're going to anoint you. So he gave me his attention, expecting to receive something. And Peter and said, silver and gold I don't have. Well, what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, he didn't stop there. Look what he did. Rise up and walk. Okay? And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up immediately. His feet, ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood, walked, and entered into the temple with all the frozen chosen people. Now remember, this man was sitting at the front of the gate, beautiful. Peter says, okay, what I, don't, what I have, I give you in Jesus' name. Get up. Didn't even give the man a chance to doubt. And you, when you're praying and you're releasing the anointing, don't give a, a person a chance to op out. So, hey, would you like to pray the prayer of salvation with me? I don't know. Come on, let's do it. Don't let them op out. Say, well, maybe later. You know, people are going to op out of something. The devil's going to jump on them and try to make it tougher for them to return. Come on, be wise. So when you got them right there, pull them right on into it. What if they say, I, I forced them afterwards? You got the seed in them, didn't you? You want that seat in them. Once you get Jesus in them, God takes over. I'm going to say it again. If you can get Jesus in them, God will take over. But if you can't get them to pray the prayer and ask God in, then guess what? You have to pray from without. But thank God you can bring the seed within, getting them to pray the prayer of salvation with you. Why don't you pray after me? Well, I don't know. Come on. Jesus, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my heart. Forgive me my sin. Forgive me my sin. Get them to pray the prayer. Get that seed in them. Hello? Because who waters the seed? Who causes the seed to grow? Amen. Our job is to preach the gospel, to do what we can, right? Yes. Tell everybody you love Jesus, but tell the people you love, that don't know that you love Jesus. The people that do know you, they know you love Jesus. You can tell them too, but find somebody you can tell. Tell them how good Jesus has been treating you, how good God has been working on you. Can you say amen? Amen. So they expected to receive, receive something. When you share Jesus under the anointing, it will tantalize their curiosity. If you do it right and don't confront them about their sin, but cause their curiosity to want to know more, God will take it from there. Say amen. Don't come against people with the gospel. Invite people to join it. Didn't Jesus not come into this world to condemn the world? He came through this world so it might be saved. Hello? No condemnation. So, <coughs> pastor, excuse me. Pastor, when I used to preach, I preached a hard message and it was confronting. And you know, when you're being confronted all the time, Hey, it's better to go somewhere where you're liked. <laughs> Come on, laugh with me. And so you have to learn to draw people in because God is inviting everyone to come know his son, isn't he? And you, guess what? You're filled with him. So you, you're filled with it, sister. Amen. All right, a couple of points. Number one, we have God in us. He does the anointed walk. He's the one who's anointed, and we release him. So get this. We have God in us. He does the anointed work. We must release him by our spirit man. So when you pray, don't pray off the top of your head. Pray out of your spirit man. Slow down, formulate your words, and bring God out when you talk. You don't believe me? Watch. God. You can feel that. Why? Because you're bringing God out of your words in your spirit. Say amen. amen. 
And you can literally knock people down. You can literally remove cancers by the way you speak. So speak right. Say something that makes sense. Just don't babble. Two, the miracle working God who dwells in us and surrounds us when we go in his name. So you're literally covered, your ambassadors. Listen, if I'm going to go over and be an ambassador for the United States, I better have United States backing. If I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ, whose backing do you have? God's. So guess what? You don't have to second guess God. Just go in his name. You don't have to second guess God. Go in his name. Now, does that feel better after I prayed for you? All right, moving right along. Let me bring this up to you. Let us take a good look at the anointing within us, the new man. So I'm going to talk to you. There's two places. Let me give you the reference. Um, it's in Luke chapter, uh, I think it's 5. Luke 5, 36 through 39. It talks about two different kinds of anointing. I'm just going to not read it, but tell you. Okay, it talks about a wine skin, and it talks about a new piece of garment. Everyone say wine skin, new piece of garment. All right, in the Old Testament, the anointing came down upon people because no one had Jesus in their heart yet, right? So the anointing would come on them, but as soon as they were done with their task, the anointing would leave them. We can look at, uh, let's look at uh, David. When he was anointed by God, he and his mighty men wiped out myriads of unclean people and things that God told him to take care of. But when he was not under the anointing, he committed adultery and fornicated because he couldn't keep his lusts in check. Now, don't get mad at me. This is Old Testament, remember? But still God calls him a man after his own. Because he kept going to God saying, help me, God, I'm, I'm a mess. I want to serve you, but the, when I want to serve you, evil is present with me. Sounds like Romans 7, doesn't it? So in the Old Testament, the anointing would come on, but then it would have to leave because of the carnality of human beings, the sin nature. And so it's likened and talked about as a new piece of garment sold on an old garment. You can't take... An old garment, which has a hole in it, take a new piece of garment, looks just like it, sew it on the old garment, because when you wash it, it begins to shrink and pull away from the old garment. That's the Old Testament anointing. When people got anointed, they did the task of God, and when the task of God was done, the anointing would leave them, and they'd turn back into the old man again. That's where we get our teaching about superheroes. It's all through the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it's not so. We have an anointing within and anointing also without. Everyone say, I'm clothed with power and I'm filled with power. Now I need to get to the gas station. Yeah, and that's your prayer life in the morning. Without that, you're going to have an iffy walk. It might be good one day, it might not be good one day because you're not bringing God in charge and he's not leading the way. See, I got it. All right, let's get into this. All right, so Luke chapter 5, let me read it real quick, verse 36. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a, a piece of a new garment, the anointing, on an old, otherwise old, because the new piece of garment tears away from the old piece of garment, and that garment is left worse the beginning, okay? Verse 37, and no one puts new wine in an old wineskin, or else the new wine will burst the wineskin and just spill out. The, the wineskin will be ruined, but new wine is put in a renewed wineskin and conditioned so it can handle the expansion and retraction. So let me put it this way. New wine is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, my mom used to make wine, so I watched her. And wine ferments, doesn't it? It bubbles and ferments because of, because of the curse of the law. And so if you were going to drink grape juice, which they call wine, they'd put it in a wine bag. Everyone say wine bag. 
and, and in the desert, because it's hot and they can't keep it cool, the wine will begin to ferment. And the wine bag will swell out, and if you're not careful, it will burst and ruin the bag. That is Jesus' teaching about our spirit. God has to recondition our wine bag. Everyone say wine bag. Our spirit. How does he do that, Pastor Kerry? Well, when you got born again, he anointed your spirit with oil and took out the sinful nature, the Adamic nature, and put his nature in you. So now your spirit man, which is elastic, expands and contracts like a wine bag, can now expand hugely and contract hugely without any damage because God dwells on the inside of you and he's rubbed you down with his oil. So back in the days when they wanted to carry wine across the desert, they would take it and soak it in olive oil until it became very, very porous and very, very elastic. And then they'd fill the wine, and then they'd fill the water, and it would keep itself from bursting open when they traveled across for a day or two. Hello? God wants to fill you full. And then as you pour yourself out, he wants to fill you again. And as you pour yourself out, he wants to fill you again. And so to do that, we have to stay elastic. We have to stay in the prayer, letting God condition us. Say amen. Can you condition yourself? This is a joke. It's amazing how some of us can even put our makeup on. Let God condition you. That's why we go to God. That's why we pray to God. We say, Lord, I lay myself down. Thank you, Lord God, for getting me conditioned for this day. Anoint me, appoint me for this day. And then we get up and we move in the spirit of God. Then if God has an assignment for us, we're ready to receive it, ready to move in that realm. Say amen. <clears throat> okay. So say I'm a wineskin and I have God's clothing. So let me just break it real quick. Jesus said, go to Jerusalem, disciples, and wait for the promise of the Father, which you shall be endowed with power from on high. Then the day of Pentecost came, and it says the Spirit came in like a mighty rushing wind, and it came upon all. Didn't say it filled, it filled, but also came upon all that were gathered there. So we have two anointings. We have the anointing within, say amen. And we have the clothing anointing without. Say amen. So when you're doing something for God and you present yourself to God and he has something in your day where he needs you to do something for him, the clothing will come down, the anointing will rise up and you'll be aware of it. You'd go, okay, God, what do you want done? Watch for that. Be ready for that. You might be somewhere. You might be at home. You might be at work. Remember, God knows all the conditions of every heart, of everybody that's around you. And you're a carrier of infectious gospel. Your job is to be under the anointing, to be able to give it out whenever he tells you to. Say amen. amen. And as we sow, so shall we amen. reap. Give them out, get them in. Give them out, give them in. Why are you so blessed? I've been giving Jesus out. Amen. What a time to give Jesus out. During Christmas. All right, so let's go on to our point two. Are you with me? We have an anointing to know and to flow. You see, who lives in you? Does he know everything? So here's what happens. The God who knows everything, as you pick up your Bible and as you're studying and you're praying, the God who knows and is aware of everything will bear witness to truths. And the Lord, the scripture says, da, 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 and he goes, mm, and then he opens your eyes and you go, wow, what is that? That's the anointing in you to know God things. Can you say amen? It's in every born again believer. Say, I have that anointing to know all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now remember, the all things that God talks about is not everything that's in the world. Not plane crashes, not cancers, not sicknesses. It's talking about what he's deposited in us is always working together for our good. Always bringing us to a better walk with God. Can you say amen? It's time we listen to it. Because this is where God lives. All right, catch this as we get done. All right, in 1 John chapter 4, please. 
We're going to look at four through six. I kind of preached myself happy. Amen. Look what it says. You are God, little children, and have overcome them. False teachers, worldliness. I, excuse me, I got the hiccups now. Because he who is in you is greater than he that's in the... Remember, you've got the almighty God in you. Get up, get refocused, and get up from your prayers and go into the world. You have almighty God in you. You've got to rehearse it in your mind. Look at that. Amen. And he says, greater is he that's in you. Verse 5. They are of the world, therefore they speak as the world, and the world hears them. We are of God, and he who knows God hears us. He who does not know God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Say amen. Then go on down to 1 John chapter 2. Um, down from my page, go over, go left, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, 26, and 27. But you, say me, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. You see, God knows all things in you. And if you trust and you tap that source, he will tell you what you need to know when you need to know it. Isn't that good? I love that. That same anointing will teach you. Now, it says here, as we read on, you don't have, need a pastor, you don't need a teacher, you don't need certain people to tell you what to do. Now, he's relating to those people who are, want to meddle in your life and tell you how to live. That's, he's not referring to teachers like me and ministers like me that speak into your life about the word of God. That's, he's not saying this. So let me read it to you so you can get that distinction. And it says, okay, they are of the world. Now it goes on. You have an anointing of the Holy One and you know all things. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Verse 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. You do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things. And is true and is not a lie. And just as it's taught you, you will abide in him. So inside of you, you have God. His job is to gather the things, bring to your remembrance, and teach you about what you're experiencing. To sift out the bad from the good and to help you walk in the good and receive all that God has for you. Can you say amen? That's why we have Jesus in us. If we could do it on our own, we would, but we can't. We have to have God doing it, taking the lead. Amen. So we can look at this. We have an almighty God living in us, correct? Yes. So we should learn to walk from the inside out, from the anointing, and learn to flow from God. This takes a little bit of training. Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do, and even greater works. Why? Because God's dwelling in you. He will do the work. Thirdly, the goal is to touch lives, win souls, and to be led by the Spirit. Here's where the enemy had in the last 20 years. He's gotten the church to try to meet their own needs and try to get their own lives blessed. Now, our job is to win souls, touch lives, and God will take care of us. If we put ourselves and our needs first before God, we won't ever become a, a soul winner or, or a life changer. We'll become very selfish, and eventually you'll give up on everything. But thank God we die to ourselves on a daily basis and what we give up is an infectious gospel and we give out Jesus Christ. And as we give him out, our lives are taken care of. We don't really need to say, hey God, you know, I have need of this and God, I have need of that. No, what we really need to do is back the devil off from keeping us what is rightfully ours. All right, moving right along. So we have no need for anybody outwardly to teach us because even if we're all by ourselves in the woods, God inside of us can teach us. Can you say amen? So have faith in the God in you. All right. Let's go to our third point. The will of God is staying filled with the Spirit. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. 
we are God's children, he does not want us to take on the cares of this world. He doesn't want us to take on the burdens. Look what happened in the last few years dealing with America and, and the stripe and the fighting over what happened and what this. Just a trick of the enemy, even though it's terrible and even though we, you know, we, it, it affects us. We're not to be caught up in it in such a way that we're unusable to God. We need to be free where God can move us where he needs to move us and we can share. We're not all caught up in the affairs of this life. Say amen. And that's what this scripture is all about. And it says, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is for every believer. And do not be drunk with wine, and, which is dispensation or debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts unto the Lord, giving thanks, now listen to this carefully, giving thanks always for all things, everything, no, all things to God. See that little word to? Some people teach, oh, you just thank God for everything that comes your way, and then he'll just move you on, blah, 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 blah. No, no. Thank God for what is God's, and thank not for what is the enemy. Render under Caesar what is Caesar's, and what is to God, what is God. Do not thank God for evil that's happening to you. Thank God for him getting you out of it. Say amen. So we never praise the Lord for circumstances. We always discern which ones we receive and which ones we don't. It's called discerning. We discern what comes our way or what we don't or accept. All right, are you still with me? All right. Speaking to one another in Psalms. You know what a Psalm is? Roses are red, violets are blue. Jesus loved you and so do I too. It's, it's an ode, it's a poem set in, so that's what a psalm is. So you see your psalms, there's songs and poems, amen. And hymns, I'd come to the garden alone, right? What a friend we have in Jesus, more of your common worshipful hymn songs. Jesus sang a hymn before he went out and been crucified with his disciples. Are you with me? Psalms, hymns, spiritual song. What's a spiritual song? That's a song that God drops in your heart and suddenly you just start singing it. You don't know where it came from. It just in your heart to sing. And he gave me one. Get up and shout the victory. Don't sit around. Jesus set you free. Get up, proclaim his liberty. Praise God. Praise God. Don't you know he's coming again? We must praise and magnify him. So get up and shout. Shout the victory. That's a spiritual song. See, it comes just like that. Are you, are you ready? And once in a while, you'll see me hamming up. The spirit will get on me. And I'll start singing something that doesn't fit the words on the screen, but that kind of fits. That's a spiritual song. It's coming out of your spirit. You're expressing yourself to God. It's the most beautiful thing that you can do. Say amen. Everyone go, I love God. Go ahead. There you go. Do, do, do. Amen. And he loves you. Amen. So hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Making melody in my heart. I'm making melody in my heart. Making melody in my heart unto the King of Kings. Right? All right. So we know that we're to stay filled with the Spirit so the enemy can't lay stuff on us. Hello. If we're so caught up in good things and you have somebody come up and, and they're just totally negative, you're going to immediately discern a, oh, wait a minute here. Right? All right, let's go to our last point. Everyone say, thank God. Amen. Our last point is this. Moving in the Spirit confidently. Folks, who lives in you? So when you go and you meet with God, the first thing, he sets that confidence in your heart. 
You don't have to try to believe. You just trust God is with you. And then you go and you say, God, it's an adventure. You and I, mostly you, me following, and take us into this adventure, Lord. And when the day I saw Jesus in my vision, and he said, your life's going to change from here on out. Just like whenever I do something, I always bring change. But be careful, and this is what he said to me, don't review your previous life. Review every day like something new. And that it's you and I taking you through this life and showing it from my point of view. It's a new point of view. Can you say amen? He gives us a new point of view. Sometimes he has to lift us up higher to see from his, his sight. Can you say amen? So here we go on this one. Hebrews 3, 14 says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Anybody here planning on backsliding? Look at your neighbor and say, not me. Anyway, where are we going to go? What's out there? Everything is temporary, broken. Everything is, so there isn't anywhere to go. But you know, we can take God on our vacation. We can take God to our relatives. We can take God on our telephone conversations. We can bring God into everywhere we, can, we go. And the thing that would be mundane is no longer mundane because we are God indwelt. We are God appointed. We are God anointed. Can you say amen? And finishing up with you, then I'm going to anoint you. And remember with this anointing, I'm, it's not going to be what I say. It's going to be the anointing that you feel and then you Go to God and open up to him. Can you do that? Yeah. Okay, good. Here we go. Hebrews 10, I love this one, 35 through 39, dealing with confidence. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance. That's the old Greek word, patience. Who's patience? See, the way the Jews believed is they believed it was a supernatural side force of God called patience. And somehow he would zap us with a little bit of patience and we're to allow that to work in us. That is absolutely error. The patience that we have is Jesus. Hello? Yeah. And he has the ability to bring us to perfection. What it says, let patience have his perfect work so that you be perfect, needing and wanting nothing? Hello? That's in James chapter 1, verse 2. Let patience have her perfect work. Patience, now put Jesus. Let Jesus have his perfect work. So he can bring you into perfection. Everyone say amen. amen. That requires us to step back and let God take the lead. That requires us to sit down in his authority and let God stand up in his glory. That requires us to get out of the way and stay humble so we don't get big fat heads and not get through the door. Come on. Amen. Nobody needs a big fat head. I used to have one. It would fall over all the time. Amen. Musicians, they, they feed on everybody's praise and everything. And boy, when I came to know Jesus, everybody left. And God says, just me and you, son. I said, I guess I need to befriend you. I need to get close to you. And he says, I guess you need to. And so it's been an adventure ever since I got saved. I can tell you time and time again, and one day I would love to share my mission experiences when I was on the mission field. One time we were in the mission field, and I just decided, I don't know why, I'm going to make it short, that I wanted to go down to see a voodoo temple. And right down the street, like in Haiti, is where I was missioned four times, taking groups and teaching the ministers in Haiti. Well, the second time I went in, I wanted to see a voodoo temple. They're set up like a godly temple, but completely opposite. It has three chambers, outer court, inner court, and the most ugliest of ugliest. And so I went in there. I took my interpreters with me. There was uh, Jim Caldwell, and there was uh, Steve uh, I forget his last name, and a couple others. And I walked in, and of course, I'm just full of myself. And I, and I walked in, 
having a group of us. I walked in, and there was the guy, the high priest, and his priestess is standing there. Now listen. I walked in with a group of people. Now remember, we're just kids. We're excited. We wanted to share the gospel. I walked in, and the man said, I've been expecting you. God had the night before given him a dream, showed him my face and me, coming in, and he renounced Satan and pronounced himself to be a Christian. And so when I went in, now I got to show this real quickly. When I went in, he was expecting me. God had already set it up. See, it's a great adventure. You go with God. You let God do these things and keep the enemy bound. He's a real turkey. So I walked in, they were expecting me. So it wasn't anything leading him to Jesus. So let him, Jesus, forgive me, I sin. I renounce uh, Satan, renounce all this voodoo and all that. It's called a voodoo, a voodoo, or whatever it's called. And so they renounced all that. We started singing Christian songs. We were in there. He showed me all of these secret things. We took, we took some um, zombie dust, some of those chemicals that they make people into zombies, um, I'll talk about that later on. It's actually a puffer fish, and it kills their brain, slows the respiratory, and they bury them, dig them up in a couple of days because they're not breathing so fast, so their oxygen is still there. And they're brain dead, so they just follow people around like this, and they call them zombies. Really, their brain is dead through drugs and chemicals, and they raise their children from the dead, and so we give you our child, we'll follow you, you high priest. Anyway, so that's what they did. And so we got some of that, took it to the University of Washington. We saw a stuffed, a real live stuffed baby from four generations. They stuffed a baby. Oh, it's terrible. Anyway, this is all overwhelming to me, but now they're saved. Unbeknownst to me, I'll make it short. I was supposed to, as the Christian missionary, and all of our Christians, when we walked in, because it's a voodoo temple in Haiti, we were supposed to die. We weren't supposed to come out alive. Nobody told me. <laughs> Witchcraft only believes, only works when you believe in it. It doesn't work if you don't believe in it. We believe in God. Nobody told me that this was supposed to happen. So when we got ready and we put our arms around each other, we were marching back to the mission house, singing Christian songs. And we're singing every, and we get out past the temple and there's over five, 600 people standing there. They came out to see the missionary die. I didn't die. The whole town ripped down all their voodoo temples. This is in Corfu. And declared it a Christian province. Now, they did that after I left. But we were just kids that wanted to go in and share Jesus and just get Jesus out there and just follow God. That's what it is. It's an adventure. And we did that. God did that. And revival broke out. Man, they ripped those temples down. I get this call from Terry and Carrie Nelson. I said, you won't believe what happened after you left. Revival broke loose. They started burning the temples, and they started declaring and marching in the streets. Bring Jesus out in the forefront. He's the one that does the results. We just bring him out. Can you say amen? Don't hide him away. Bring him out. Set him on a lampstand and finishing. Again, it goes on. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which had great reward, where you have need of endurance, having after done the will of God, you will receive the promises. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not wait. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul will not have any pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back into backsliding or perdition, but to those who believe to the saving of our soul. So church, we are to be Christ-developed, Christ-led, Christ-appointed, Christ-anointed. Are you ready? So I'm going to come around to each of you.